Hello. Today is the second Sunday of Advent, the 5th of December, 2021. Participating in this service, Dr. Alan Mosier with a dramatized recitation of Luke 1, The Visitation and the Magnificat, the Lawrence County Brass Band performing Songs of the Season, Shane Donnelly, video photographer, and myself. As you have indications, both the outside and the inside of the church have been decorated for Christmas. We are grateful for the workers and their labor of love. After worship this weekend at the in-person services, Santa and Mrs. Claus will greet the children. Arrangements have been made by the Social Life Committee. Congregant Carol Leet, in a telephone conversation, requested that I convey to you that he has viewed every online service since Palm Sunday, the 5th of April of 2020. Carl is confined to his home due to poor health. He sends you his greetings for your encouragement and support of him and for his appreciation of this outreach via Facebook and YouTube. You have a good day and a good week. Today is the second Sunday of Advent, and we light the second Advent candle. The scripture is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. and girls. We are traveling to different parts of the world and finding out how other Christians and other cultures observe Christmas. And they do many of the things that we do, but then they have some unique things that we do. We're staying put in our own country, the United States. And this week, we're going to travel to the Southwest. And four states make up the Southwest of the United States. Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico and Arizona. And I'm certain that you know what Santa Claus looks like, but if we would go to Texas, you'll find Santa Claus wearing cowboy hat and cowboy boots, like these kids are on his lap. Do you think Santa Claus wears a cowboy hat? Well, he does when he goes to Texas. Now, Santa Claus comes to our place with a sleigh and reindeer. But if we would go to Texas, the sled is pulled by eight longhorn steer cows. Cows 
There they are. Or sometimes when Santa Claus says I want to pull out the sleigh with the longhorn, he rides on a horse like a cowboy. Do you think that happens? Maybe he makes an adjustment when he goes to another part of the country, right? I, I think that's the idea. Now we have decorated Christmas trees everywhere, but if we were in the Southwest, we would find that people decorate the cactus, the cactus that grows out on the desert. And here you go. Isn't that kind of different? And also another thing that we might find in this part of the country, people will decorate a barbed wire wreath. That's not a grapevine wreath. That's made out of wire, like you use on your ranch. And that would be very common. Also, red peppers. Make a red pepper wreath and hang them uh, from your porch. That would be very common. And of course, you don't see that in Newcastle. And now you would think on Christmas Day, everybody would want to be with their family and friends and have big dinners and give presents, but it's very, very popular in the state of Texas. On Christmas Day, you go to a football game and the major stadiums will find its teams and hundreds of thousands of people cheering in the bleachers, as we see here in Dallas. And in this part of the nation, for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, they build lumber pyramids and they set them on fire. And it's, it's to bring a light into a darkened time for the shepherds to find their way to Bethlehem. Okay. Now, we might know what a luminaria is, and we have them in Pennsylvania, but it's not as popular as it is in this part of the nation. And you take a bag, and I don't want you doing this, you never do, you never light matches, you never light a candle without an adult, okay? Promise me that. But what people do, they will take a bag, a white bag, and put sand in it and a candle, and they light the candle, and they put it in the bag at night, on Christmas Eve, and it's to create a pathway. Here you see a luminaria along a walkway in the city of Santa Fe, which is the capital of New Mexico. The you see how beautiful everywhere, lining the rooftops, the churches, the parks. They have thousands and thousands of the luminaria. And the idea is the shepherds hearing the birth of baby Jesus from the angel went into the dark night. They didn't have street lamps. And that you're creating a lighted pathway so they can find their way to the manger and worship Jesus who was born to be the Savior and the Lord of all. Also, if we would go to Texas and Oklahoma, you might even find a cowboy nativity. And here is Jesus born in a ranch stable and Mary and Joseph are like a cowboy and a cowgirl. What do you think? All right, so we're trying to take our culture and connect it with the story of the Bible. And Jesus is loved and adored by the people in Texas and Oklahoma and New Hampshire and Arizona as he is in Pennsylvania. And your gift this week is a little cactus. Giving you a cactus, not a real one, and you can hang it on your Christmas tree. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, chapter 1, verses 39 through 56, the Visitation and the Magnificat, from the King James Version Bible, dramatically presented by Dr. Alan Mosier. And Mary arose in those days 
and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath holpen his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercies, which he spake to our fathers to Abraham and to his seed forever. And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Following the death of our mother, my brothers and I had the monumental task of going through the vast accumulation of stuff at the old homestead in Sewickley. In my mother's cedar chest, I discovered this baby book all about me. The stork dropped me at 4.54 a.m. I weighed in at 7 pounds 5 ounces, and the doctor delivering me was James Gilmore. I wish that the mother of our Lord had kept a baby book. I have more questions than I have answers. Inquiring minds want to know. Was Mary exempt from morning sickness? Did she have sudden food cravings for ice cream and pickles? How did she explain her situation of being a pregnant virgin to her parents and to her fiancé Joseph? Sandwiched between the Annunciation and the Nativity is the only episode connecting the nine-month pregnancy of Mary. These 18 verses comprise an event known simply as the Visitation. Immediately after the announcement by the angel Gabriel that she had been chosen to be the mother of the long-awaited promised Messiah, Mary went to stay three months with a kinswoman named Elizabeth. Kin means relative. Many modern translations render cousin but a much older and better understanding is that Elizabeth is an aunt. We do not know if Elizabeth is an aunt to Mary by way of blood or through the marriage of husband Zacharias. Tradition gave the names of Joachim and Anne, A-N-N-E, as parents of the Virgin Mary. And the early church fathers taught that Elizabeth was a sister of Anne, making Mary a niece. Also, there was an ancient belief that Mary was an only child of her father and mother. The first part of the visitation puts Elizabeth in the spotlight. The latter portion, Mary takes center stage. When Elizabeth and Mary speak, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. God is talking through them. Mother Mary broke out in a song called the Magnificat, acquiring its name from the opening words in Latin, my soul doth magnify. 
just before the birth of John the Baptist, for some unspecified reason, Mary departed and returned to her hometown of Nazareth. The sacred text says that Mary took off to an undisclosed village in the hill country of Judea. Commonly, the location is said to be the modern-day Hebron in Israel. Previously, we read that Gabriel had informed Mary that Elizabeth was six months pregnant with John the Baptist. We do not know how Elizabeth had a recognition that Mary was also expecting a baby. Usually, it is interpreted that Elizabeth was bestowed a supernatural discernment. This scene from the greatest story ever told is a mine shaft with nuggets of gospel gold, guaranteed to enrich our calling as a disciple of Jesus Christ. The five areas I would like to zoom in on are, number one, the role of a spiritual advisor in one's formation. Two, the sanctity of life of the unborn. Three, Mary's unique role in the drama of salvation. Four, the promotion of women in ministry. And five, the inauguration of a revolutionary movement. As an aspect of Fred Gilbert's preaching, is for us to examine alternative and often bypassed perspectives of Scripture. The Eastern Orthodox Church does not call this story the visitation. Instead, it is labeled the embrace. No mention is made in Luke 1 that these two women made physical contact. But in religious art, Elizabeth and Mary are often depicted as about to wrap their arms around each other. Mary was not instructed by the angel to go to Elizabeth. She went of her own volition. Elizabeth is a sterile, post-menopause old woman on Social Security and Medicare. And having a baby through the agency of her husband. Mary is a pregnant teenage virgin, the one occasion never to be repeated miracle by the Holy Spirit. These gals are at the opposite ends of the age spect spectrum, and both are in unusual predicaments. Mary actively sought out her Aunt Lizzie to be her spiritual advisor also called a spiritual guide, spiritual advisor, or a spiritual mother. Just as we might recruit a personal fitness trainer or a coach to steer us in weight loss, bodybuilding, and athletics, the individual desiring a more intense, intimate bond with God seeks out a spiritually stable, well-adjusted, mature man or woman to form, shape, nurture, interpret, and define the quest for God. To make use of the discipline of a spiritual mentor presupposes that the inquirer has already experienced a life with God and is hungering and thirsting to take it to a new level. The spiritual advisor is a sounding board, confidant, and a soul sister or brother serving as the catalyst to assist us with making sense out of life in a Christian context, viewing personal incidents from a spiritual perspective, providing advice, and fosters the growth, development, and maturity of a relationship with God. Possibly a grandparent has nurtured you in the faith, a congregant with whom you have had a private conversation, or a friend from youth to whom you go back time and again as an oasis from which to drink may be a mentor. Contemporary Christians in America tend to be lone rangers and imagine they can walk the walk and stay on the pilgrimage of faith by traveling alone. The light bulb comes on when we arrive at the conclusion that other people have walked this road before me and perhaps they are further along than I am and I can tap into their reservoir of experience. Looking up to these believers as wiser, usually older, 
I can be energized and discern the hand of God in my life. Calling upon the rich experience of the advisor, the understudy is alerted as to what theological pitfalls to stay clear, what false teachings to be challenged, and what areas of life to be addressed. Behind every saint stands another saint. Mary did not stay at home in Nazareth in isolation. She sought out the seasoned maturity of the aged Elizabeth. And for six months, Mary was enrolled for two semesters of training, acquiring insight for living for the days ahead. Elizabeth was the sounding board. Her home served as a haven of rest. Mary would be equipped to deal with the conversations related to the future marriage to Joseph, to see herself as a conduit with the fulfillment of prophecy and the drama of the ages. Do you have a spiritual advisor? Have you derived benefits from this relationship? Number two, if you are looking for a pro-life scriptural support, the visitation should settle the abortion issue for a Christian. Nowhere in Holy Writ does it come out and say, Thou shalt not have an abortion. The Word of God from cover to cover underscores the existence of a personal identity while in the, in the womb. As soon as the pregnant Mary walked through the door, the second trimester John the Baptist in the womb of Elizabeth leaped for joy, sensing that he was in the presence of the Messiah. This passage gives evidence that the unborn were not perceived to be a blob of cells, but capable of hearing and recognizing voices. According to Luke, the very first person on the planet to address Jesus as Lord was Elizabeth, and she conferred this title on him when he was an embryo in his mother's womb. The liturgical name for the festival of Christ's birth is the Incarnation. The Son of God became a man. At what precise moment did this wonder occur? The Creed finds us reciting, He, not it. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. God took up residence in the womb of Mary. Are you aware that Tim Tebow is the poster child for the pro-life movement? His parents, Bob and Pam Tebow, were Baptist missionaries to the Philippines. While pregnant with Tim, Pam became deathly ill from drinking contaminated water and was in a coma for a period. Medical counsel in the U.S urged Pam to abort the child. The strong drugs she took to combat her illness were guaranteed to cause severe disabilities for the unborn. Trusting in God to bring her through this quandary, Tim Tebow was Pam's miracle baby. A member of this congregation for whom I shared this detail in her eulogy was a preemie, four months pre-born. The daughter was kept alive by her mother, placing her in a blue enamel roasting pan, providing warmth in the oven of a coal stove. She was fed with an eyedropper. This woman lived to be 95. To the pro-choice crowd, the sexual freedom advocates, and the feminists, I say, yes, it is a free country and they have the right to an opinion. But if they call themselves Christian, their stance is at odds with the faith, and their thinking runs contrary to the teaching of the Book of Books. One out of three pregnancies in the nation is terminated by abortion. The majority are not due to health risk to the mother, rape, or incest. It is a backup form of birth control. Mother Teresa of Calcutta cautioned us, 
Any country that accepts abortion is not teaching its people to love, but to use any violence to get what they want. This is why the greatest destroyer of love is abortion. Number three, Mary is to be honored in perpetuity, but it is unscriptural to lavish a too high a stature upon her. Little Jimmy wanted a puppy more than anything. He pleaded nonstop with his parents and even made it a matter of prayer. Thinking he would receive a doggie in his Easter basket, Jimmy was disappointed. Imagining he might be surprised for his birthday, Mom and Dad did not come through with a pooch. With Christmas around the corner, Jimmy became more desperate and prayed with intensity for a canine. Grabbing a statue of the Virgin Mary from the desk, Jimmy wrapped it in a cloth and hid it beneath his bed. Kneeling to pray, the lad uttered, Jesus, I want you to know, if you ever plan to see your mother again, you better give me a dog for Christmas. 500 years ago, when Protestants broke away from the Catholic Church, among the conflicts was the excessive devotion the Church of Rome showers upon the Mother of the Lord. Catholic doctrine encourages praying to Mary, claims that she bypassed the original sin of Adam and Eve and assigns her the title Queen of Heaven. Each December, Protestants recruit a sweet girl to don a blue veil for the Sunday school pageant, and Mary appears with frequency in the songs of the season, and her figurine is displayed in the nativity stable beneath the Christmas tree. But after the holidays, we don't hear a peep out of her until next year. The angel Gabriel, in his greeting at the Annunciation, declared Mary to be blessed among women. Elizabeth welcomed Mary and said the very same thing. And in her song of praise, Mary said of herself, For behold, all generations shall call me blessed. The big Catholic church in Elwood City used to go by the name BVM, Blessed Virgin Mary. And some Protestants are uncomfortable with this designation, but it is biblical. No woman on earth has been more immortalized in art, music, literature, architecture, and places named after her as Mary. Undoubtedly, she is the most famous female in civilization. Mary is a mortal, and she is also properly viewed as a good example of faith and virtue. Conservative Presbyterian theologian R.C. Sproul went as far to say that Mary is his candidate as the world's first Christian. She had the singular experience of knowing Jesus the longest, 33 years from cradle to grave. With both Catholics and Protestants entrenched in their positions on Mary, I suppose we will have to agree to disagree. Number four, a possible subplot in the visitation is the challenge of the male hierarchy, the priesthood and rabbis, that society may impose restrictions on women in the first century with religious expression. But Elizabeth and Mary are not held down by attaining an intimacy with God. These two girls are related by blood, but both are filled with the Holy Spirit and are linked as participants in a new move of God with the coming of the Messiah. Another giant step. Mary saturated with scripture and biblical imagery showed herself to be a walking Bible. Critics question that someone with Mary's background at such a young age could master this articulation of a holy text. Girls did not learn to read and write. Mary was a poor peasant maiden, incapable of such poetry. Mary carried 
the Word made flesh in her womb. She carried the words of God in her head and heart. These lyrics reveal a composition by the original Madonna. Mary was raised in a pious home, and although education was not stressed for all girls, Mary is the exception to the rule. And what is to prevent us from looking upon Mary as a woman with a high IQ? Elizabeth was a PK, a preacher's kid, and married to a priest. Don't you know pastors' wives who are more gifted than their husbands and who spiritually are the ones who help keep the congregation together? Elizabeth and Mary spearheaded a movement that women may be locked out of their leadership in male-run ecclesiastical institutions, but God can work outside the powers that be with the performance of His purposes. Five and last, with the pronouncement of the Magnificat, Mary inaugurated a revolution with political, economic, and social implications. The Magnificat is the longest speech spoken by any woman in the New Testament. Thomas Cahill, known for his series, The Hinges of History, termed the Magnificat as the most muscular poem of celebration in all ancient literature. He said, This is a larger-than-life song of triumph, thanking God for righting all wrongs. A man had a worn, tattered testament, Matthew through Revelation. It belonged to his father, and for sentimental reasons, he wanted to have it rebound. The printer was to engrave three words, the New Testament, on the backbone of the small Bible. In an effort to reduce the cost, the shopkeeper substituted the New Testament with three letters, T and T. And the Christian scriptures are dynamite. And the Magnificat is the fuse. Mary has been likened to a revolutionary and a freedom fighter leading a crusade to serve notice to the bigwigs. The exalted will be humbled, and the humble will be exalted, and the loot held by the haves will be taken from them and redistributed to the have-nots. The mighty will be dethroned with power transferred to the lowly, the cause of a beleaguered Israel will be championed and everything turned on its head. The assertions of Mary are not what she will do, but what will be implemented by God the Father Almighty, who keeps His covenant, safeguards the remnant, aligns Himself with oppressed minorities, and upholds the cause of truth, justice, and righteousness against the prevailing falsehood, injustice, and wickedness. Do we catch the force of Mary's prophetic song? The big kahunas of the world, impressed with their own self-importance and foist misery on their populations, are served notice. You are coming down. The king of the universe will swat you like a fly. Saddam Hussein of Iraq Idi Amin of Uganda, Ho Chi Minh of North Vietnam, Fidel Castro of Cuba, Gaddafi of Libya, Fernando Marcos of the Philippines, Juan Perón of Argentina. Where are these despots gone for good? Maybe you remember the Nicaraguan kingpin Somoza, a head of state who was a thug. He outlawed the public reading of the Magnificat, even in the church. Look it up. Somoza mandated the entire population carry proof of having voted for him in the national election. Wearing a medallion around their necks, the peasants called the locket a Magnificat. 
This locket contained a slip of paper indicating a vote for Somoza. It also contained the words of the Virgin Mary. This weekend, at the in-person services, the congregation sang the carol, I Heard the Bells, on Christmas Day, which contained the lyrics, Then pealed the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. Is this just a pious platitude, or do we really believe that God is in charge over the entire shebang? God is acting in all the unprecedented upheaval of our day. Advent is a much needed season of hope, and the progressive lighting of the candles on the Advent wreath are a symbol of the light that cannot be extinguished, but it will increase and dispel the darkness. The Lord is behind the scenes of the dismal reports and disruptions going on all over the world. After Hurricane Katrina ravaged New Orleans, a small store had suffered major damage. The shopkeeper set up tables on the sidewalk with a sign, Open for Business, and the customers inquired, What are you selling? I am selling hope. This church is a center for hope. And how do we spell hope? House, a personal encouragement. And holding on, praying expectantly. Motivational speaker John Maxwell says it right. Hope shines brightest when the hour is the darkest. Christ is our hope. He offers peace every day. With Mary, we proclaim His mercy extends to those who fear Him from generation to generation. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.